you might be wondering, why is the Atlantic Council in the Asia Pacific? Uh, and the reason is uh, the Atlantic Council started in 1961 in the middle of the Cold War with a strong focus on uh, NATO, as you might imagine. Um, uh, kept going, but um, around uh, 12 years ago, greatly expanded the scope of its work. The Atlantic Council went global. Since then, uh, perhaps the fastest growing um, think tank in Washington with uh, centers dealing with pretty much every function you can think of in every region you can think of, and in particular, uh, relevant for these purposes, the uh, Asia Security Initiative under the leadership of Dr. O oh, here on the panel has grown very significantly. Uh, we're in Korea uh, very frequently talking to our Korean colleagues and it's a real honor to be here with, with uh, all of you today. Now uh, uh, let's turn to our panel. It's my view that uh, we're in a new era of history. Um, we don't know what future historians are going to call it. But to me, at least, there's a couple of elements that are very, very clear. One, uh, we do see renewed competition among the great powers, uh, and we'll talk a lot about that today. But I think second, and very importantly, uh, that competition is not going to be like previous great power rivalries. We're in very different conditions. And to me, the defining element of those conditions is we're at the very beginning of the digital age. It's just starting. Even though it feels like we've been in it a while, the technologists tell me that the types of technologies that are coming are going to be even more significant than the communications and information revolution. We're talking about biotechnology, uh, quantum computing, and a range of other technologies that will have very significant implications for society, for, for the economy, for security, and therefore for geopolitics. So I think you know, keeping those two elements in mind is very important so we don't revert back to the old uh, context where previous rivalries uh, played out. So the good news is we're at the beginning of this era and US strategists have not yet defined, uh, at least to my knowledge, have not yet said what the goals of this competition are. So to me, it's a very important moment for this conversation because this type of conversation can help inform how the U.S. defines its goals in this competition. What does the U.S. want? How does it even think about framing the competition comprehensively, narrowly, etc.? Is there room for cooperation between the U.S. and China? Uh, how do others see the competition? In particular, here we are in Korea. And so what are the implications for U.S. allies? How does the U.S. plan to bring them on board if this is a new strategy that is going to last for several decades? These are all very fluid conversations. So it's really a, couldn't be a better time to be in discussion with, with this panel and with all of you. I'd like to just make a few comments uh, up front. One is that... Um, um, we live in a very interesting time in the sense that um, from the Cold War, uh, which was essentially a bipolar world, we moved into what people were hoping for was, would be a multipolar world that would be uh, free of, freer of conflict and introduce an era of peace and prosperity based on rule of law, um, fair trade, market uh, competition, and the like. And um, we seem at this moment, at any rate, to be retreating from that concept more back to a, a, a more bipolar world with the uh, US and China facing off on a number of fronts. Um, but no one, sh no one should confuse that with the fact that we see it as a, a, a retrenchment to uh, a Soviet era like uh, confrontation where uh, there was a wall between essentially uh, Eastern Europe and, and the rest of the world. That, that is not in the cards, that's not what's going to happen. But it does, it, it does um, conjure up uh, the requirement for deep thinking about what this world is going to look like and how we're going to, uh, to exist. 
Um, so the bipolar world uh, and, and, and what that means has more economic overtones, uh, more trade overtones, uh, more scientific overtones and the like. Um, and the entire definition really of what we talk about when we talk about international and national security is, not, is no longer just about the size of one's air forces, armies, or navies. It's really about um, economic security, energy security, climate security, food security, um, cyber security, and the like. Uh, we live in a world where technology has uh, gone, uh, has progressed so rapidly that the regulatory framework, at least in my country, has not kept up with the, uh, with the progress that, uh, that we've made through science and technology. And as a result, the, the cyber world is largely uncontrolled and spiraling, if we're not careful, out of control. One of the things that uh, uh, we try to convey to our friends uh, about how to think uh, about the administration is, is to watch what it does even though you may have some difficulties understand the, the how the administration embarks on its uh, foreign policy. Um, the big question, I think, it remains to what happens to countries that are in the middle of this uh, emerging struggle. Second point I would make is that, um, and, I, and I think as a former general officer, it's a little unusual to hear this, but I don't see the military equation as being dominant in the solution set uh, to this new uh, emerging great power competition. It's an important component, but as opposed to the 20th century when it was the dominant uh, chess piece on the table, I don't think that's the case anymore. The world has changed a great deal since uh, the demise of the Soviet Union. The concept of national and international security is much broader. Uh, it includes um, a number of uh, subjects, as I mentioned. It's always possible that you could have a military skirmish, um, accidentally or otherwise, particularly in this region. But the 21st century challenges that face us, I think, are more complex than ever. And the solution set, uh, in my view, calls for regional military interoperability. Uh, we have a, a very successful example of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and uh, economic relations and trade relations to offset uh, what I would call the militarization of trade, whereby the penetration by one country into another society is so dominant that it can actually it, um, replace some elements of national sovereignty in making decisions um, for their security future. And finally, let me suggest that uh, despite these ongoing difficulties, I, I believe uh, that democracy will emerge in a better place. It may take some time, uh, but for that to happen, I think like-minded nations will need to one, once again coalesce around value-based propositions that have always defined our approach to countries who advocate state control over all things and all people. Um, but success will, will take time, as I said, but the outcome will be a good one. And the Cold War outcome is perhaps a, a good example that patience and um, uh, steadfast reliability on our core values and our principles, in addition to fostering trade and better security relationships, um, are certainly very important. So if we can't say that today, it seems to me that we'll be... Uh, there will be long-term consequences if we ignore the strategic penetration lending to, leading to domination and control of free societies. We are more than that, I think, and we are better than that. And I believe that our commitments to the security of our friends and allies is inviolate, especially where the Korean Peninsula is concerned. And on that, there is wide agreement in the United States. But we must form the coalitions necessary for regional economic competition, um, and we must continue to value those principles that separate us from communism, and in so doing, move the global order towards security, economic stability, and prosperity.
all based under the fundamental principle of the rule of international law. Thank you. Now we'll turn to um, Tom Bossert. He is a distinguished fellow um, in the Scowcroft Center at the Atlanta Council. He also was assistant to uh, President Trump for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, a wide portfolio, uh, very challenging, including cyber. Um, and he was, uh, in the Bush administration, he was deputy assistant to the president for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. So someone who has great continuity in U.S. national security and homeland security circles. He's a technology expert uh, of the first order, uh, and we'll want to talk about that with him. And I think the question for, for you, Tom, is if, if, if people, if we are in a competition, sort of what, what is the, uh, to borrow a term from the business world, what is the U.S. value proposition uh, as it enters that competition? How should, uh, what, what, how does the U.S. think about itself and its role in the competition? And presumably, if it's a competition, that means how does the U.S. think it's going to win? Thanks, Barry. I love that question, and uh, thank you for having us. I'm really deeply honored and humbled to be on the same stage with General Jones and Dr. O and, uh, and Mr. Pavel. I've attended a few of the sessions, and this has been a fascinating forum for me to listen to the perspectives in the region. And, and I'd like to maybe, before I answer that question directly, reframe... Uh, my fundamental attitude towards this this talk. Uh, I have views, and they're strident and, and, and well-formed and deeply held, but uh, to come to any region of the world and promote them often sounds awfully lecturing in tone and nature, and uh, no one likes to be lectured. And so uh, the value proposition on which I'll expand in a moment is quite simply the benefits of free market competition. And what I don't want to do is lecture this part of the world on that fundamental assertion because what we have is a competition. Uh, what we don't have is the power to make you decide which economic order you wish to entertain. So the value proposition being capitalism, uh, very bluntly and directly, uh, it's a uh, system with imperfections, no doubt, but it is better than the alternatives, in my view. Uh, the value proposition, however, has one new problem and new challenge that we haven't all studied for a very long time, and that is the application of its core principles to the development of technology that, in some cases, is based foundationally on principles of sharing, sharing of data and sharing on a core protocol level of computing power, things that are anathema to property ownership, its use by individual property owners, the right to exclude others who don't own that property from its use, regardless of the motivation of that exclusion. And lastly, the third principle of, ideally, the freedom to transfer that property between two parties without an undue influence from outside third parties, often the government. So that seems like an awfully academic lecture on the, the core principles of capitalism, but as it applies to technology, I believe the world has a problem because we haven't figured out yet how to apply those principles to things like data, shared computing, and the benefits and proceeds from the, at this stage, olig uh, oligopoly, not monopoly, that controls much of our uh, technological expansion. So uh, traditionally, at least in the United States, we've stopped teaching comparative economic systems in our universities because after all, since the 90s, the presumption is the matter has been settled and that centralized planning was deemed a failure and that we could get on, as the general said, with our multilateral utopic future. And I think that what we're seeing today, and to answer your first question, Barry, uh, to General Jones, uh, is, a, is, a, is a confluence of two phenomena. Uh, the rise of Chinese uh, quasi-communism uh, with uh, at least what had been a temporary recession or decline uh, in U.S. economic growth. And uh, that terrified most, most Americans. Uh, and the current president, I think, rode uh, into the White House on that fundamental fear. And, uh, and his, his, um, his diagnosis there might not be wrong, uh, but his, his pro proposed cure has most of us uh, wondering academically. I, something dawned on me that might be a little bit uh, flippant, but maybe something we all understand. Uh, I think uh, this president doesn't completely reject multilateralism. I think he'd like there to be an ultimate outcome in which there are groups and friends and allies all seeing the same 
things and, and treating the world the same way. I believe the general's correct on that. Uh, but his pathway towards it uh, tends not to start in multilateral negotiations where one must convince others of your view prior to taking action. Uh, in other words, when we get on an airplane, we're told to first put the oxygen mask on ourselves before we help those around us. And the president was in a position where he believed the U.S. economy was in an emergency in extremis and required him to take immediate action before helping all those other uh, allies and, uh, and competitors alike around him. So uh, when you hear him demand more uh, in terms of a commitment militarily, uh, I believe uh, you shouldn't feel singled out. He has done this consistently throughout uh, his presidency to all of his allies. Now I want to turn to Dr. Mian Oh. She is the director of the Asia Security Initiative in the Scowcroft Center in the Atlantic Council. She is a senior fellow also and widely published, uh, published in a wide range of areas. Uh, the, the key question for Dr. O oh is this Indo-Pacific concept. We're talking about the future of U.S. strategy. This clearly is an element of U.S. strategy. So, so uh, would welcome her views on how do we think about this concept? How do other uh, uh, countries view this framing? And, and what is the vision for the Indo-Pacific? Thank you, Barry, and it's an honor to be on the panel with General Jones, Tom Bosser, Barry Pubble. Um, so um, my fellow panelists have made it clear how, United, how the United States emerging strategy toward China is based on strategic competition. And I think the ultimate goal of the competition is clear. First, like General Jones, um, already described, the United States wants to update, revitalize, and defend the rule-based liberal system that affirms international values and norms that emerge after the, the end of World War II. Second, the U.S. would like to see China become a constructive part of that system in the future. However, when it comes to working with allies and partners in the region, what I see as the biggest issue with executing this competitive strategy against China is the tremendous transitional challenge facing those Asian countries who would seek to align themselves with the U.S. vision. How can countries whose economies already depend heavily on China take the first step to walk away from China and then diversify their dependence? If these close allies are hesitant to embrace a strategically competitive framework because they don't have resources and are not capable of directly competing with China, how can we expect others with less direct security cooperation to the United States to follow suit? That is why I, I think my most important policy recommendation for the future of U.S. strategy in Asia is this. Any successful strategy could include, should include explicit and clear short and medium term transitional steps for reducing dependence on China to achieve a long-term goal. No country could possibly sever connections to China overnight, and any version of a U.S. Asia strategy that assumes that Asia allies and partners could or want to do is doomed to fail. We're talking here a decade-long strategic vision and without a clearly articulated roadmap of how we get there, I don't see US and its allies and partners goals being realized harmoniously and in a coordinated way. As equally as important, I also like to say for those Asian allies and partners, that share the same goals and values for the rules-based liberal system, articulate way they want to avoid admitting an uncomfortable reality of competition with China in the short term and express a desire to work with the United States in the Indo-Pacific to achieve a long-term goal by acknowledging the strategic environment that China's rise has created for what it is. The World Knowledge Forum, 